and good morning to everyone out there in the technological world listening online or watching. Did you have your ears attuned to that last song? Did you hear Ezra and Nehemiah singing that? Because that's what they were doing. They were standing on God's promises. Well, this is number three in the uh, four series version. And although perhaps I'm not reading as much scripture as I would like, uh, I think you're getting the, the general message of each one and how they are all linked together. Joel, Haggai, Zephaniah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Malachi. <laughs> now, up there, I cut myself short last week, actually. Just a little bit more on the visions of uh, Zechariah before we do a very short version of Esther. <clears throat> the first vision, the four horses, the central thought of that is God is Lord of all the earth. And then the second and third vision, the four horns, the smiths and the measuring line, is talking about God coming to his people and the temple being built. Four and five, the reclothing of Joshua and the golden candlestick is talking about God's anointed ones, the high priest and the Davidic descendant. In other words, it's a type in that sense of Christ, both as our great high priest and the Davidic descendant, the Messiah, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Six and seven, the role, the ephahs and the women and a fourfold message is all talking about sin being removed from the people and to the house that was built for it. In other words, the temple has been built. And then um, the, the eighth one, which is actually in chapter eight, um, God again is Lord of all the earth. So all of those prophecies revolve around who God is and the worship of God and whom he has appointed. And that's the connection between Zephaniah back to uh, Ezra. Now, to go on a little bit further, in the intervening period between Ezra and Nehemiah, which was a gap of 80 years, we have the story of Esther. But what has Esther got to do with the return to the land? Not a lot, except while not directly connected to the return to the land, the story of Esther demonstrates God's everlasting and continual care for his covenant people. And we can take that to ourselves as well. We are his covenant people, the church. Some people think that the church has replaced Israel. No, it hasn't. The New Testament has three groups of people. You have his chosen people, the Jews. You have the church. And you have call it the Gentiles, the unbelievers, call it what you like, but there's three groups in the New Testament. The events of Esther are not set in Babylon. They're set in a city which can be called either Susa, S-U-S-A, which was a royal city, or it's also referred to by another name, Shushan, S-U-S-H-A-N. And again, it's in the era of the Persian Empire. 
And the events of Esther are sometime between 483 and 471. And Xerxes the Great, the one who ruled or who attacked Greece and got repulsed, went back and started licking his wounds. Uh, he's king. And Esther documents what happened to the Jews who didn't return to the land. And according to Esther, they were scattered among the people in all the provinces of the empire. And in those provinces, they kept themselves separate. They were doing what they were supposed to do in the sense of remaining separate from the people around them. They were separated from their world, if you like. Now, when you read the book of Esther, it reads as though everything happened within a few days. But it didn't. Esther was queen for 20 years. And she'd been the queen for five years before the evil Haman, described in the book of Esther as an Agagite. So he was a descendant of Agag, who was the king of the uh, Ammonites, conquered by Saul, killed by Samuel a couple of hundred years before. He hated the Jews and he had risen in prominence with Xerxes to the point where he could make a request that a decree be given that all the Jews be slaughtered on a given day. And all this came about because another Jew by the name of Mordecai, who happened to be Esther's uncle, just refused to bow down to him. He would not bow. You don't bow to a man, you only bow to the, to the Lord God. And Haman was demanding, not just bowing down in honour, but bowing down in worship. And Mordecai would not worship Haman. Now, it doesn't say worship in the, in the book. It's the wording, the way it's worded, the bow down. And one is not just bow down as you would to somebody in a position of honour. It was bow down in worship, and he wouldn't do that. So Haman said, here's my chance. I've got the in with the king. I'll get all these Jews wiped out and I'll avenge my great, 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 great granddaddy. Anyway, <clears throat> Mordecai spoke with uh, Esther and she was a little bit hesitant because, you know, and he said to her, look, just because you're a Jew doesn't mean, or just because you're the queen doesn't mean you're going to escape from this necessarily. And there's a famous quote from the book in Esther 4, in verses 12 to 14, which finishes up, and who knows, but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Now that struck home with Esther. So she went back and tried to work out how she's going to get the king because they couldn't rescind their decrees, but how she's going to get the king to issue another decree that cancels out the first one. And she does. She invites him to a banquet and that's good. She invites Haman as well. And anyway, when she announces he's a Jew and the king gets a bit uptight and walks away and Haman falls on the, on the couch where she is pleading for his life. And the king comes back and says, I turn my back and you attack my wife. That was the end of Haman. And all his 10 sons got hung on a spike as well. And their wives and their kids. You didn't just do the old man, you did the lot. So it can lead you to wonder 
or in fact, the king did issue another decree. And that decree was that on the date that Haman had set that these Jews were to be wiped out, that the Jews could arm themselves and attack whoever attacked them. And in fact, they did. They did exactly that. And I've forgotten the exact number, but quite a number of uh, um, Haman's henchmen uh, finished up sort of losing their head a bit. So what influence, you can wonder about this, what influence did Esther, Mordecai and Daniel have upon the Persian kings that allowed them to do what they did for the Jews under Zerubbabel, Ezra and Nehemiah? Daniel had a lot to do with uh, Zerubbabel being given the permission to go back and being given the means to do it and a military escort as well. And he took about 50,000 people back with him. <clears throat> so Daniel was the number two man in the kingdom. Here, the protection of the Jews comes about because in God's timing over a period of time, Esther, like Joseph, had risen to a royal position in the kingdom. She was the number one wife. She was the queen and remained so for about 15 years afterwards. Mordecai, he was promoted to a high position. So we have a Persian kingdom with God's people in very high position, basically running the kingdom. And the greatest contribution, I believe, of the book of Esther, it's an exciting read. I remember somebody saying uh, over at the Plains one night how he'd read an exciting book. It was full of political intrigue and murder and sex and all sorts of things. And everybody's going, <gasps> and then Alan said, I just read the book of Esther. <laughs> And that's true. It is an exciting book to read. But the principal thing in it, it should heighten our appreciation of God's providential care for his people. Bible miracles de demonstrate God's ability to intervene directly in space and time. He's not limited in his power. He's fully capable of controlling what happens in our real world. You know, you've got the wonder of Exodus and the plagues and a passage through the Red Sea and the daily manna that God provided. They were obvious interventions by God on behalf of his people. But you see, the obvious miracle is not the norm of scripture history like our own daily life tends to flow along in a natural way there's a process a sequence of events in which causes lead to effects and both cause and effect can be traced and understood to some people, the flow is simply one of chance. You happen to meet a person while you're standing in a queue. You're not going anywhere, so you start talking to the person next to you. You just happen to meet them. That just happens to lead to a job where you just happen to meet the person who becomes your spouse. Is that pure chance? Or is that coincidence? Or is that the hand of God working in your life through circumstances? Not miracles, circumstances. How lucky, some people say. I don't believe in luck. I don't believe in coincidence. I believe in God incidents. And I believe in God's providential care. 
And so Esther can teach us many lessons about God's providential care and the events from which our lives and history of nations are woven are not merely subject to chance. They rest in the hands of God who cares for us, a God who sometimes permits pain, but who is well able to transform pain into, into joy as we rely on him. And so a couple of things you might like to think about does the person who knows God see him more clearly in miracle or in providence? And why do some find it hard to sense God's hand in seemingly chance events? Well, I don't have any answers. They're just a couple of things you might like to think about. But if we talk about the lessons from Esther, Lesson one, be careful to worship no one but the Lord. Be aware that showing undue honour or currying favour can be a form of worship. We get that in chapter 3, verses 2 to 15. Chapter 8, verse 17, we see where God grants seasons of favour for people in order to extend his kingdom, not for personal benefit. In chapter 4, 12 to 14, and chapter 10, verse 3, always use any advantage position for the welfare of God's people. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you necessarily give them favor in the workplace if you're the boss. They have to be able to do the job and do it well. I don't mean that. But if you're in a position as uh, Mordecai and Esther were, you work for the benefit of your people. In chapter 6, verses 1 to 11, we see where a person of faith will not seek recognition because they know that God sees and rewards openly in his time. And probably one of the most important ones, chapter 1, 17 to 18, live what you speak. Don't just talk the talk, but walk the walk. As I said, it will be a very brief look at Esther. <clears throat> now let's go to the second return under Ezra. This was a vastly different affair from the first one under Zerubbabel. Ezra left with about 7,000, consisting of 1,754 men plus women and children. He didn't ask for a military escort because he had told the king that God would protect them. Now they were carrying back the treasures of the temple. They were loaded with gold. They'd have been a prime target for anybody that was seeking to make a quick quid. But he had told the king that God would protect them. And so he refused he didn't ask for it but he, he refused when the king offered a military escort he said no god is our protector so away they went it took them four months to go from uh, susa to jerusalem they took a different route Zerubbabel went round the fertile crescent they went basically straight across the desert and God protected them. So what do we know about Ezra the man? He was a Jew from the line of Aaron, descended from the high priest, Sariah, who was killed at the capture of Jerusalem. He was skilled in the law of Moses, and he was a scribe. He must have been a man of some note among the Jews in Babylon to have won the favor and trust of the king of Persia. He is the author of the book that bears his name, the book of Ezra, of one and two chronicles, parts of the book of Nehemiah, and according to Jewish tradition, he's also responsible for Psalm 1, 
Psalm 107 and Psalm 119, which you can read when you get home. That'll give you something to do for the afternoon. <clears throat> One of the key things with Ezra and the return under him starts off in Ezra 7. The first six chapters he writes are about the return, the first return under Zerubbabel. And that's where Haggai and Zechariah come in. Now Ezra comes back. This is the second return. It starts in chapter 7 of the book of Ezra. And verse 6 gives us the fact that he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses and the king granted all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him some of the children of Israel the priests the Levites the singers the gatekeepers and the Nethanim came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes and Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month which was in the seventh year of the king on the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. Sorry, I said Susa before, it was Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. And in verse 10, we get the key. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. He prepared himself for the task that he knew that he had to perform. He was not only a skilled scribe and teacher of the law, he was a man of prayer. And we shall see throughout both the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, the importance of prayer and seeking God's will in all that we do. And as a result of his prayers, Artaxerxes gave Ezra over and above that for which he had asked the Lord. Because the Lord answered his prayers. Now the decree of Artaxerxes is in ch uh, chapter 7, verses 11 to 28. And we won't read all through it, but in verse 15, we see there, they were to carry the silver and the gold which the king and his counselors had freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. So the Persian king and his top echelon have all donated to the God of Israel. See, the influence of the Jews on the Persian kings was far greater than just allowing them to return. I'm not at all sure that they weren't believers in the God of Israel, the way in which they poured favor on the Israelites. And in verse 17, Ezra gets instructions. Be careful to buy with this money bulls, rams, and lambs with their grain offerings and drink offerings and offer them on the altar of the house of your God in Jerusalem. And whatever seems good to you and your brethren to do with the rest of it, do it according to the will of your God. And in verse 20, whatever more may be needed for the house of your God, which you may have occasion to provide, pay it from the king's treasury. Hey, this is getting better and better. And in 21, Artaxerxes issued a decree to all the treasurers who are in the region beyond the river, it's the Euphrates, whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven may require you, let it be done diligently. Up to 100 talents of silver, 100 core of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil, and salt without prescribed limit. Not only has he given him a whole lot to take back, he's issued instructions to his own governors over there. Whatever Ezra asks for, give it to him up to this amount. 
And I can't remember off the top of my head uh, what the different weights are now, but a hundred talents of silver, uh, roughly translated into modern language, it'd probably be something like 250 million roughly, or possibly even more. So he's told them, whatever Ezra asked for, give it to him. Further than that, in 24, it shall not be lawful to impose tax, tribute, or custom on any of the priests, singers, gatekeepers, nethinim, or servants of the house of God. And then he told Ezra, according to your God-given wisdom, set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people who are in the region beyond the river, all such as know the laws of your God and teach those who do not know them. Then he says, let judgment be executed speedily on anyone who doesn't observe the law of your God and the law of the king, whether it be death or banishment or confiscation of goods and imprisonment. Part of Xerxes basically gave Ezra a free hand to do whatever he wanted to fulfill the prophecy of Jeremiah concerning the then promise of the return to the land. And Ezra had been appointed as governor of Jewish matters and the land of Israel. Now, there's a little bit of a difference here between Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra was appointed as governor of the Jews. When Nehemiah came, he was appointed as governor of the provinces beyond the river. So Nehemiah not only had religious clout, he had political clout. Uh, that's the difference between the two in that sense. See, God's promises are always fulfilled to the finest detail. He always helps us when we ask him. Who do you trust? Yeah. It's good to ask others for help, but the one we can always count on for help is the Lord our God. Well, when Ezra arrived in Judah, he found that the people of Israel had not kept themselves separate from the people of the land. Remember now, he's coming 80 years after Zerubbabel. The temple was built. The people were all hot for God. And when he comes a few years later, no, no, no. They've gone bad again. They hadn't kept themselves separate from the people of the land. They'd begun to intermarry with them. Not only was intermarriage commonplace, but the spiritual and political leaders in Judah were the worst offenders. Ah, oh, deeply shaken. Ezra tore his hair and tore his clothes. And in that time, that was a sign of intense grief and or anger. And he slumped down before the temple. At evening, he rose, fell on his knees, and he prayed. Ezra's prayer was a prayer of confession. And as he wept aloud, a large crowd gathered. They too began to weep bitterly. The Spirit of God was using the anguish of Ezra to touch the hearts of his people Revival was about to break out. Ezra's prayer, you can read in chapter 9, verses 6 to 15. And each paragraph here we go, can reflect its content. In Ezra 9, 6 and 7, Ezra identifies with his sinning nation. In verses 8 and 9, he affirms God's grace and goodness. In 10 and 12, he pinpoints the commands the people have broken. And in 13 to 15, he recalls past punishments and expresses fear of God's righteous anger. 
Well, did that have any effect? Oops, back one. Right. <clears throat> yes, it did. In verses 1 to 15 of chapter 10, we see where the people were deeply affected by Ezra's impassioned prayer. They volunteered to repent and to make a solemn covenant to send away their pagan wives and their children and so purify the nation. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Having been confronted with their unrighteousness and their sin, <clears throat> their unfaithfulness, the whole assembly said, Yes, you're right. Now, they put away their pagan wives and their children. Now, that's not an easy thing to do. <clears throat> and once again, you can see something in a couple of verses that actually took a couple of years. It didn't happen all at once. And it started firstly with the priests and the leaders, and then they sent people out to check on the, the common people in the country. <clears throat> and so once again we have the nation being fully committed to God's law yeah that's an outline I'll let you read that for a minute while I try and get rid of this <clears throat> I think if nothing else, <clears throat> we look at chapter 7. <clears throat> Ezra had prepared his heart to seek, to do, and to teach. Three things. Seek, do, and teach. Seek the Lord. Do what the Lord says. Teach others. Ezra is also credited with having created the synagogue. And the synagogue became the place where the appointed Levites who were to teach the law would go to the synagogue and they would teach the law to the people outside in the synagogue. And that apparently is the history of the synagogue. Ezra appointed them as teaching points. So, lessons from Ezra. God honours his word. Be assured that God made certain that his word is fulfilled. Godly living is standing up for what you believe in the face of opposition. Remember that God will honour those who honour him. Always seek God's counsel and avoid the advice of the ungodly. Take sin seriously. Remember the cost of forgiveness. Include repentance, confession of, and forsaking our sin. Believe that God can work wonders through our submission to civil authority, even when it's hostile. Trust his ability 
to work his will. Don't try to do the job alone. Enlist the aid of others with like mind and vision and learn to lead in confession of sin as a model to others. <clears throat> now it's interesting in the structure of the Jewish Old Testament. Firstly, you have the law, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Then they class the prophets and they have what they call the former prophets and the latter prophets. The former prophets being Joshua, Judges, 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings, followed by as latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and the 12 minor prophets. In the writings, they have Psalms, then Job, Proverbs, Ruth, Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes, followed by post-exilic writings, Lamentations, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Z uh, Nehemiah and 1 and 2 Chronicles. So 1 and 2 Chronicles is actually the last book of the Hebrew Old Testament. But Ezra and Nehemiah were originally one book, which is why parts of Nehemiah are also written by Ezra. But Nehemiah did write a lot of the book that bears his name. And the only reason one and two chronicles are separated is because they were too long to fit on one scroll. So they divide them in half according to the length of the scroll on which they were written. So we'll have a look at Nehemiah. Ezra continued his work in Jerusalem for some 12 years after the events that are recorded in his narrative. And then he actively cooperated with Nehemiah in his endeavors. And the structure of the book of Nehemiah firstly is reconstruction and reform. That covers the building of the wall and then chapters 1 and 2 is the expedition of Nehemiah to Jerusalem. Chapter three is how he assigned workers to their tasks. Chapter four and chapter six talk about the opposition of Tobiah, Sanballat and Geshem. And chapter five is the reform of unjust usury among the Jews. And chapter seven is completion of the wall and the census of the city. The second half of the book is talking about renewing the religious life and religious reform, and that's chapters 8 to 13. Chapter 8 is the public reading of the law by Ezra, followed by the Feast of Tabernacles. 9 and 10 talks about the renewing of the covenant, a national fast, the prayer of the Levites and the sealing of the covenant. Chapter 11 through to 1226 talks about the population of the uh, distribution and a census of the priests. Chapter 12, dedication of the wall and chapter 13, cleansing of the temple, the Sabbath and marriage reforms. So what do we know now about Nehemiah, the man? He was born in exile. In his early life, he was exposed to great temptation, although the appointment he held in the Persian court was an honourable one. He was what we would call the personal butler to the king responsible for ensuring that the food and drink offered to the king was not poisoned. 
He was a devout man, a man of spirit, faithful, simple-hearted, patriotic, and godly. He was valued by the pagan monarch as a good and faithful servant. And as Jesus said of Nathanael in John 1, 47, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. So Nehemiah was a true Jew from the heart, a godly man serving a pagan monarch as a faithful servant. He arrived in Jerusalem some 13 years after Ezra. As I mentioned earlier, he had the rank of governor of the province. He had full authority to rebuild the walls, which, notwithstanding the erection of the temple, still lay waste. His administration lasted some 36 years. And the secret of his efficiency lay in his constantly bringing problems before the Lord as a man of humility and purity of motive, revealing the power that can be exerted by someone who has no purpose in life, but that which is centered on God. And of course, the book of Nehemiah continues the story of the Jewish exiles who returned to their homeland. Ezra himself came back about 458 BC and his spiritual leadership led to a vital reform which we've just heard about. The events recorded by Nehemiah are some 12 years later, 446 BC. And <clears throat> a broad outline chapters 1 to 6, the walls are rebuilt. <clears throat> chapter 7 to 12, the covenant renewed, and chapter 13, the sins of the nation are purged. Now, of course, the covenant referred to is the Mosaic law or the law at Sinai, the Sinatic law, whatever you like to call it. That was the covenant to which the Jews were recalled to, re to renew. Why did Nehemiah go? Well, we see that in chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Ahariah, it came to pass in the month of Shislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel. So he's in Susa. Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who were left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Now, cities in the ancient world were walled for protection. That's logical but the walls were also symbols. Unwalled cities merited contempt. Walled cities were seen as significant. Nehemiah couldn't stand the thought that the city of God should not have walls, and he committed himself to rebuild them. And then chapter 1, verses 4 to 11, contains Nehemiah's prayer. He was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. See, it was a jolt for men like Ezra and Nehemiah to discover that Israel needed fresh beginnings. The people of God had returned to the promised land with great expectations. They traveled hundreds of miles to rebuild the temple, but they stopped at bare foundations. Stirred up by Haggai and Zechariah, they made a fresh beginning, completed the temple to be ready for the Messiah. But the years passed. 
the Messiah did not come. And the old patterns of life, the old materialism, the old values crept in. There was no excuse. It was wrong. But it did happen to them, just as it happens to you and to me. When a people or an individual does drift from God, it's time for recommitment. Time for the fresh start that God is always willing to give when we return to him. If you seek the Lord with a whole heart, he will be found of you. And he will take you back into the fold. If it's a true repentance. Not just words of the mouth, but spoken from the heart. Nehemiah was a high official in the Persian court. And out of concern for Jerusalem, he asked for and was given permission to serve as governor of that minor district. Where he served for 12 years, he then returned to Persia. And he came back a second time to Judah to govern there. Unlike Ezra, Nehemiah exercised political power, yet his colourful and decisive leadership dealt with more than restoring respectability to Jerusalem and rebuilding the walls. He also committed himself to purifying the lifestyle of God's people, bringing them into conformity with God's law. It's striking to realise that even with Ezra in Judah, teaching the word of God to the people, they still drifted from full commitment. And can't we say the same of ourselves? It is so easy to drift from full commitment to God and to his word. By Nehemiah's time, intermarriage was again a problem. And doing business on the Sabbath day was an established way of life. It was time for another fresh start for God's people. And Nehemiah's decision to live on this insignificant parcel of land, rather than to continue in his important position in the capital of the great Persian Empire, seems especially dramatic. It is a measure of the man's commitment to God. He was prepared to endure hardship. He was prepared to give up a position of power and influence. And yes, he was a governor, but of an insignificant province far to the west of the Persian Empire because of his commitment to God. And next week, we'll finish off with more of his boldness. And we'll get through, I hope, into Malachi. So at that time, if I can preempt Trevor for a moment. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the lessons that we can learn from these yes, stories of the Old Testament, the history of your people that you want us to know. Lord, we give you thanks for that and we give you thanks for the time of fellowship as we go and we have a cup of coffee and a bicky together and we can talk of you and of your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.